Good morning, Trinity. This is the day the Lord has made. Well, good morning and welcome to worship this morning, whether you're joining us uh, online or in person. We are so glad that you are with us. Uh, my name is Pastor Mike, and I have the honor and privilege of being the pastor here at Trinity. Uh, a few things uh, coming up in the life of the church that you'll want to know about. Uh, today, following the service, we uh, continue in Community Support Month. We'll meet in the parlor, which is directly behind the sanctuary. All of us will meet there. Um, we'll get a few words of instruction. We'll put together uh, our gift bags uh, and, uh, and then have a panel discussion for, uh, about, uh, and with educators. The office will be closed tomorrow. Uh, just be aware of that. Uh, on Tuesday at 6 p.m., we'll be celebrating, our, uh, celebrating Mardi Gras in the Fellowship Hall. You can RSVP online, uh, send an email to the office, uh, or just let me know, let somebody on staff know so we have uh, an idea of uh, how many to prepare for. Uh, Mardi Gras has been, uh, last year anyway, uh, was a fantastic time of celebration and fellowship, uh, so I want to encourage you, uh, if you can make it at all, please do come. Uh, then Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Believe it or not, we are starting Lent already. Uh, at 7 p.m., we're going to be having our Ash Wednesday service at St. Paul's. Uh, that's near 32nd in Breton. Um, 7 o'clock there, um, and we'll be, it's, a, it's a cooperative service that we'll be doing. Uh, Friday at 1 p.m., God's Naturehood is meeting uh, at Roselle Park. Uh, snow or shine, I am told. Uh, Pints with the Pastor will be this Friday at 7 p.m. at Brewery Vivant. Please uh, come out for that. Uh, family camp registration is live. If you've never done family camp, uh, check it out. It's, uh, it's, it's a really good time. If you've been doing family camp for years, make sure you get in and register. The sooner, the better. Uh, and we are hoping to have uh, all of the RSVPs for that by the 27th of this month. Uh, and then United Women in Faith is going to be having a soul care retreat. That's going to be Saturday, March 11th at 9 a.m., uh, there's going to be music and movement and journaling and self-care and lunch. Uh, and there is just a suggested donation of $6 for the lunch. Please RSVP to the office uh, or to Nisha. Good morning. My name is Janine Morton. I am happy to be here with you this morning. And I can honestly say I slipped in. Please take a moment to fill out the connection card in your pews during our offering. You can bring them up and place them in the basket at the back of the sanctuary after the service. Today's altar flowers are beautiful and provided by Steve and Sue Sudheimer in loving memory of Alicia Sudheimer. Welcome, good morning, and welcome. Welcome to this place and this time of worship. Welcome, if this is your first time through these doors, or if you've been coming here for years. To be baptized and those not baptized, welcome. To members and non-members, welcome. Welcome to the doubters, the believers, and the doubting believers. Welcome if you are male or female, black or white, rich or poor, young or old, or somewhere in between any of these. Welcome, no matter who you love or who loves you. Welcome all to this place and this time of worship.
called to worship. One, it is easy to stand in the valley of our comfort. We know what to expect and what is expected of us. But Christ calls us to the mountaintop to receive a new vision. We are not sure we are ready for that. Place your hope and trust in Christ, for he is our guide. We invite you to stand and sing with us. Remain seated if that's how you're comfortable.
please join in our opening prayer? Holy One, light of light, God of all creation. Long ago, you showed yourself to the disciples in Jesus' transfiguration, his face glowing like a field of daffodils on a bright spring morning, shine in us, around us, and through us, that the world may see your love in the faces of all your people, faces transfigured in the light of your love. This time I invite the children to come on forward. I have a question for you. You might not want to admit this, but that's okay. I might ask it anyway. How many of you have ever been able to watch more than one episode of a show you like in a row? How many of you? How many of you have been able to watch like three episodes in a row? Or like, what about four episodes in a row? About five episodes in a row. <laughs> Grown ups, you need to be raising your hands too. <laughs> so I want to tell you something. That, that is a, a very recent invention. When I was young, and when a lot of people in here were young, if we watched an episode of our favorite show, we had to wait a whole week to see what happened next. And sometimes, if it was the season finale of that show, we might have to wait six months to see what happens next. Now, Netflix asks us if, we, uh, if we're still here, still watching, and we click yes, and we just keep going. This, this kind of, uh, it's kind of impressive, but it also uh, helps, helps to uh, teach us how not to be patient sometimes. So in the story we're, we're going to read in a little bit, uh, for the grown-ups, um, something happens that like really doesn't have an answer, it doesn't tell us exactly why, it just sort of happens and we're left in a mystery, we're left hanging we don't know what, what happens next or what it all means. And you know what? That's okay. See, part of, part of the fun of life, part of the uh, enjoyment of faith that we have sometimes is the mystery of it, the not knowing, the being able to, to think and dream and pray about what's coming, what's happening next, okay? And so it's okay if in our faith, we don't have all the answers to all the questions. Sometimes it's important for us to be able to sit with the mystery, okay? To sit with the not knowing and be okay with it. It's, it's not an easy lesson to learn, especially when we can just click on the next episode on Netflix because we want to do that with our faith. But sometimes it's really important that we learn, okay? All right, so we're going to pray. You guys are going to repeat after me. Grownups are going to help us out, okay? Dear God, thank you for loving us and inviting us into your mystery. Help us to be content in our knowing and in our not knowing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good morning. So I am Laura Johns, the Director of Discipleship here at Trinity, and any of our friends who are pre-K to fifth grade can come upstairs for children in worship, and we'll ask grown-ups to pick them up upstairs by the elevator um, in about an hour, 11.15, so. All right, see you later.
Our scripture for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, be with us in this moment, in this time. Help us to know you, to see you, and to be immersed in your love. God, save me from me. Place me at the foot of the cross. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I have had a love-hate relationship with school most of my life. I loved to learn, but I hated having to go to school. I hated having to deal with other students. It didn't help that uh, elementary through middle school, uh, I had to go to a private Catholic school. I did not like going to the private Catholic school. We were one of the poorest families. We uh, wouldn't have been able to afford the school except we got a scholarship from our church. I had few friends, and I was teased, and I was bullied a lot. So I begged my parents from kindergarten through seventh grade. I begged them to transfer me to the public school, but they didn't. My struggles with other students didn't really seem to matter to them. My dad just kept telling me that those hardships would build character. As I hit eighth grade... I was confronted with the reality that a lot of my classmates, at least the ones that I considered friends, were going to go on to the private Catholic high school. Most of the bullies, on the other hand, were headed to the public high school, and so my begging to go to public high school, our public school, became begging to stay in private school. But the family budget wouldn't bear it, so I went to public high school. On the upside, I was finally going to get to go to a public school. On the downside, it was a school full of kids I didn't know, and the ones who knew me only knew me as a target for their ridicule. Nothing was going to change, except that things were probably going to get a whole lot worse for me, and there was nothing I could do about it. My first day of high school came, and I was more than a bit nervous. For the first time, I actually had to choose what to wear to school, because public school didn't have uniforms. The school was bigger. The class sizes were larger. I didn't know who my teachers were. My class uh, was, was no longer the oldest class. I was a freshman. I was bottom of the bottom. It just so happened that my first teacher in my first class on my first day of high school was an English teacher named John Nye. He'd been teaching for a while, uh, 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 so much so that my dad had had him for English when he was in high school. Mr. Nye had this this laid-back, old, hippie kind of vibe. He loved teaching, and he loved helping students to engage their minds in reading and writing Uh, We used to call him John Nye the English guy. As nervous 
as I was, I will never forget that first day. When I walked into Mr. Nye's classroom, it was like that bus scene from Forrest Gump when he's trying to get to school for the first time and no one really wants to let him sit. Nobody wanted to sit next to me. To this day, I don't know what made Mr. Nye do what he did that morning. For a while, I thought it was just part of his first day lesson plans. But Bree had him for English freshman year as well, and she doesn't remember this lesson. So I can only imagine that that Mr. Nye, he saw my pain, he saw my embarrassment and my anguish, and he decided to act. As class started, he stood up in front of everybody, and he picked up just a plain white sheet of paper and held it up in front of him, and he said, this is my sign. Kind of in that laid-back hippie way you see on TV. I looked hard at the paper, and there were no words on it. There was no zodiac symbol. He wasn't an Aquarius. He explained that his sign was really something only he could see. It was his emotional health. It was his mental well-being. It was his hobbies and his drives in life. It was the things that made him proud. And it was the things that made him happy. Mr. Nye continued saying, please don't tear my sign. When you say or do mean and hurtful things, it tears my sign. Those things, they rip pieces away. They make me feel bad about me. And that's a tough place to be because I cannot escape me. Then he told us that we all have signs. Not literal pieces of paper, but signs inside of us that help define us. These signs, they can be torn and they can be ripped and they can be crumpled and they can be stained. And in the end, all of the tape and all of the glue and all of the staples in the world isn't going to put our signs back together. When we tear one another's signs, damage is done and our signs will never be the same again. And so we shouldn't tear each other's signs. He explained to us how just because one sign is different from another doesn't mean it's a bad sign. The signs of other people don't hurt us. They can't hurt us, so we should be kind and leave other people's signs alone. Mr. Nye took it a step further and said that when we are ripping at another person's sign, it's because we aren't all that happy with ours. And so we try to make our sign look better by making another's sign look worse. It was a beautiful lesson for me that first day. Now, it didn't stop the teasing or the bullies, but that teacher called out the reality of it all. He let us know that those things can be seen. He helped push us toward the realization that what we say and do can have a negative impact on others. And conversely, that Positive words and good things can can add good things to someone's sign, too. It did not stop all the bullies. But I knew that that class was a safe place, where we could call out the sign tearing when we recognized it. That class was a place where we were conscious of the damage that we could inflict on others. And that was a great way for me to start each day of freshman year. That was nearly 30 years ago. If I sit down and concentrate, I can remember the names of all of my teachers from freshman year. But I couldn't articulate a more impactful lesson from that entire year than don't tear my sign. For Community Support Month, this is the week we recognize educators in our community. The Mr. Nye's among us who spend their lives pouring life into our future. The people who care for our children nearly as much as we do. The people who help teach our kiddos to reach for the stars. I have at least a hundred different stories about the impact of teachers, but on this Transfiguration Sunday, there there are two that have mingled in my mind that bring me peace and hope. Mr. Nye and, of course, Mr. Jesus. 
The transfiguration in Matthew 17 is an interesting little break in the action of that book. It's not a parable. There's no good Samaritan. There's no prodigal son. There's no specific teaching. There's no, uh, you have heard it said, but I tell you. It's just this peculiar story that sits in the midst of some other important teachings and intimate moments between Jesus and the disciples. Matthew had a reason for including it in his gospel. It accomplished some important things for his audience. It emphasized and confirmed the divine nature of Jesus. It served to ground the disciples in the reality of who Jesus is and that he can be trusted in what lies ahead. And it brings in Moses and Elijah, the lawbringer and the lonely prophet, to make clear what league Jesus was playing in. The only instructional pieces in this story are the voice in the cloud telling the disciples to listen to Jesus, Jesus telling the disciples not to be afraid, and then Jesus telling them not to tell anyone about what they had seen. Otherwise, the details are fairly vague. Jesus' face shines like the sun, his clothes get really bright. Moses and Elijah show up. We get to see Peter kind of fanboy out about that, offering to build some tents for a Holy Rollers camp out. All sorts of things. Neither the disciples who witnessed it or those of us who are reading it now necessarily know what to do with. But I believe there is a lesson in everything Jesus does, teachable moments in what is said and what is left unsaid, in what is done and what is left undone. It might not be in the lesson plan necessarily, but when the opportunity arises, sometimes you just have to take it and teach it. In the previous chapter, the disciples have kind of been through some stuff. Go back and read Matthew 16. Jesus foretells his coming death, and Peter forbids it. And for his trouble, Jesus calls him Satan. Jesus tells all his followers that they will have to walk the same road he is to pick up their cross and follow And then he gets all cryptic and says that some of them won't die until Jesus' kingdom is realized on the earth. Lots of weird stuff. Stuff they didn't totally understand. Stuff we still don't understand 2,000 years later. In this entire scene, Jesus has two lines. Do not be afraid and tell no one. The first is kind of standard in Scripture. Uh, When when human beings have close contact with the divine, we are always reading about uh, angels saying, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not fear. The second, the, the tell no one part, that happens a few places as well and for a multitude of reasons. In this case, it's most likely to keep the disciples from jumping to conclusions. See, the disciples, they had a different idea of what the coming, Messiah, coming of the Messiah meant. And that idea was a much more militaristic one, one where Jesus ousted the Roman occupiers and Israel was their own nation once again. I mean, even in the, this passage itself, we see when Peter saw Jesus transfigured with Moses and Elijah, he wanted to build temples, three temples. The tents part, uh, talking about, that Peter's talking about building, It's not about an extended camping trip with a Holy Ghost hot dog roast. It was living and wanting to live and worship in that moment forever. That was what was on Peter's mind. So it was not a stretch for Jesus to think that people might take the story of Moses and Elijah and the transfiguration and jump to the wrong conclusion. And as I studied the scripture this week, I found I was jumping to a wrong conclusion of my own. Not about the scripture so much, but something else. I'm not sure how many of you uh, are aware about what's happening uh, in Kentucky at Asbury University right now. Ten days ago, a chapel service started. It's turned into what's now being called a revival. Worship has not ceased in ten days sermons and singing prayer and testimony and confession. It has spilled out of the campus chapel and gone into nearby church buildings. 
Now, some have joked that this is one way to get an extension on a paper. Others, including myself, started out a bit skeptical, jumping to conclusions that that what's happening is simply emotional fervor, less a movement of the Spirit of God amongst those students and more uh, an emotional release that they need. I found myself agreeing with some who expressed concern that in the end, when the revival stops, that no real change would come from it. And then just a couple days later, we get news of the mass shooting at MSU. I saw social media posts from friends of mine whose kids were on campus at the time. In that moment, I thought, perhaps, perhaps this revival in Asbury, this movement of God's Spirit, might be exactly what we need. At very least, my heart was changing about it, because if if tremendous evil can move on our school campuses, then so can incredible good. And I found myself in the midst of my prayers for MSU thinking of the students and teachers at Asbury and praying that the fruit of that revival might bring about the change needed to take away the plague of mass shootings from us. Because that's exactly what our faith is about, right? Changing, transforming, transfiguring as we follow Jesus. Experiencing the metamorphosis of life in the love that Christ brings us. A life of faith is about change and becoming the best versions of ourselves, not fitting into some cookie-cutter mold of what a church or pastor thinks that our lives should look like, but becoming every bit the person we were created to be. And we were all created to be different, to be unique, to be enough. Who we were at five isn't who we were or will be at 15 or 50. We are constantly transforming. But at five, 15, or 50, we are unique creations engaged in the metamorphosis of becoming. Sometimes that change comes easy. Other times it's more difficult. But all of it moves us along in the process of becoming in life and in faith and in community. Just a day or two ago, I heard that some of the major news networks were trying to send crews down to Kentucky to do stories on the Asbury Revival, to put it front and center for audiences from coast to coast. And then I heard that Asbury University took a little play out of Jesus' playbook and asked the news networks not to come. In essence, to tell no one to wait, to not interfere with what is happening. And surprisingly, a lot of those networks listened. They stayed away. Tell no one isn't just about keeping people from jumping to conclusions. It's about allowing this, that spiritual moment, that moment of insight and experience to not be watered down by publicity to not be sullied by the pressures of capitalism, to not make itself into some sort of meme. Part of of what made joining in Community Support Month such an easy decision here at Trinity is the fact that it was designed to not be a marketing tool for the church. The goal from beginning to end is about recognizing others, about lifting them up, about letting them know that they are seen and that they are appreciated. That said, there is is something else we need to notice about Jesus' instructions to tell no one. It isn't don't tell anyone ever. It's tell no one until. Tell no one until the time is right, until after the resurrection, until the time comes for this story to be told through the lens of the good news of death and resurrection, revealing that God has always 
been with us. That's why we know this story after all, right? Because eventually, when the time was right, the story got told. That's how we found out about Community Support Month. And that's how some of you found your way here to Trinity, not because there was a big marketing campaign, but because the time was right and someone told us the story. The story of Community Support Month. And someone told you about Trinity and what we're all about. And we proclaim that again here today. Do not be afraid. And tell no one until. Until the time is right. Until you know it's the story God wants you to tell. There is so much going on in the world these days. So much that confuses and terrifies us. So many stories unfolding. But we have faith that God is at work in the world too. In the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the things that bring us fear. And we have faith that one day when we look back, when we tell the story, it will be a story full of God's goodness. A story about God showing up on college campuses and in high school classrooms and in church buildings and elementary school playgrounds and really in all the places where we are looking for God. In all the places we aren't. God will be there. Even now in the midst of school shootings and crimes against humanity and devastating natural disasters, We are watching a story of transfiguration, a story of transformation, a story of metamorphosis beginning to unfold. And we have faith that God will take our anger and our fear, our confusion and our uncertainty and transfigure it into something good, something life-giving, something amazing that will bring hope and healing to a world in short supply. And friends, we have faith that God will do the same with us. Change our lives, transform our lives even into even more beautiful versions of themselves. So let's wait with faith to see what story God is writing in our world. And in the meantime, let us hold on to Jesus' words of encouragement. Let's get up, let's not be afraid. Because God is with us, loving us, and transforming us every step of the way. Amen? Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with us. Great are you, Lord. You give life. You are hope. You bring life. Oh,
You may be seated. Let us remember God's faithful acts and sing God's praise because of all God has done for us. God has treated us with compassion and deep affection. Let us remember and give generously by offering our songs, our prayer, our lives, and our blessings. One of the many ways you can support the work of God at Trinity is through financial giving. There are several ways you can do this. You can give online at GRT. You can mail in your offering, or if you are here in person, you can walk down the aisle during the next song and place it and your connection card in the basket at the front of the sanctuary. Let us pray. Loving God, you give us abundantly more than we ask for. Our lives overflow with blessings, even in the midst of suffering and strife. May the gifts we offer back to you today be used for your service and the betterment of your beloved community. Help us to look forward to what lies ahead, that we may take hold of the life that really is life. In the gentle name of Christ, our hope and our guide. Amen.
may see. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to this place with so much on our hearts and our minds, so much that worries us, so much that causes us to fear. God, we, we lay these things out before you, looking for help, for guidance from you and from each other. God, outside of our individual lives, as a community, as a state, and as a nation, we are still hurting, still in shock from the shooting at MSU. God, we seek your grace your comfort and your wisdom in this time. That those directly affected can find rest and hope. That those of us who stand at a bit of a distance may have the wisdom and the drive to help change the world around us. To do the things that we know are right. To bring pressure to those who can affect that change. We just ask that you give us the wisdom and the strength to be there. God, our hearts also, also break for the war in Ukraine. It's a year old this month. God, our hearts break at the news of the crimes against humanity that have been committed. And God, it is so big, so beyond us. All we can do is lay it at your feet and hope and pray and work in our own circles of life to bring peace. God, we continue to pray for those living in the aftermath the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. God, we rejoice at the sounds of people being found alive. And we mourn with those who mourn at the loss of life, at the loss of everything for some. God, guide us in ways that can lead to their relief. And God, we acknowledge and are grateful that you are at work in this world. You are at work in this place. You are at work in our lives. And God, in this, in this time, in this place, we lift up the students and faculty at Asbury 
who are experiencing a movement. By faith, we, we trust and believe that it's you and that you will bring not just a, a long worship experience, but God, a worship that will change. Change who those students are more fully into who you want them to be, who you've made them to be. And God, we pray that that change will ripple out. And help all of us to see you more clearly. God, all these things and many more we bring to you. Our joys and our pains. knowing that you care for us, knowing that you are with us. Because that's what Jesus taught us. God, in our silence, be with us in the noise of our lives. Comfort us. And as we pray together as your people, help us to know your love and to make it known. As we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as you're able. Sit if that's how you're comfortable and join us in our closing hymn, number 258 in the pew hymnal or up on the screen, A Wondrous Sight, O Vision Fair, verses 1, 4, and 5.
Friends, I remind you that uh, we have our uh, community support month taking place uh, starting in the parlor. Uh, after the service, you can get uh, some snacks, get some coffee, uh, and then join us in making uh, our gift bags, uh, taking them uh, to educators this week, uh, and also joining in on our, our panel discussion. And now receive this blessing. Go from this place with a song in your heart. Go from this place unafraid. Go from this place with a story you are ready to tell. And all God's people said. Remember, friends, uh, no matter where you get your education, God loves you and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Go in peace.